Today on Across the Fence, the caterpillar that's munching on Vermont forests. It has a big appetite and it's defoliating trees across the state. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. There's a little less green in our green mountains this summer. Populations of the forest tent caterpillar are on the rise. And their favorite food is leaves of sugar maples and other hardwoods that dominate our forests. This afternoon we've called on two guests to help us understand more about this hungry caterpillar, its impacts on the forests, and our maple industry. Joining me are Barbara Schultz and Mark Isselhart. Barbara is a forestry health expert with Vermont's Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation and Mark is the Maple Specialist for University of Vermont Extension. Thank you so much for coming in and talking about this. Barbara, let's start out talking about the forest tent caterpillar, where it's from, and what does it do? The forest tent caterpillar is a native insect. We've always had it. This is our seventh outbreak in the last hundred years, so it's something our trees have seen before, um, and so our trees have evolved to survive with forest tent caterpillar. It is a defoliator, it eats the foliage of sugar maple, it likes white ash, it likes poplars, it likes a number of our hardwood species, mm -hmm. and we're seeing a lot of it this year. And so its main menu is deciduous trees? That's correct, uh, but it does have preferences. It particularly likes the sugar maple, which of course is our main tree. Not the red maple so much, um, it likes red oaks, but for us it's a defoliator of maple, and that's why it's so important in Vermont. So what's the life cycle of the forest tent caterpillar? Well, right now it's been feeding and that's why people are very aware of its defoliation. So it's, that's the caterpillar stage that does the feeding. Mm -hmm. uh, in some parts of the state, it's already done feeding. So it's now a cocoon and it'll spend about 10 days as a cocoon. Uh, you can see, oh, there's the cocoon right there. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see the slide of the cocoon and how that cocoon is rolled up inside of a maple leaf and it'll just be there for about 10 days, and then we'll get the moth stage. Um, again, that's a short-lived part of its life cycle, and uh, it lays, it baits and lays eggs. And we'll see next a picture of the eggs. And you see two there, the one on the bottom is the, are the freshly laid eggs. Um, and you can see they're nice and shiny, and that's how they'll spend the winter, as the eggs. Um, the, the photograph on the top, if we could just go back to that for a minute, well, the photograph on the top showed uh, the, the uh, there you go, it showed the, um, the eggs that have already hatched. Okay. You can see the holes in there. Mm -hmm. So um, new and old eggs. And then the next slide will show us um, the newly hatched caterpillars, and that'll happen just when the leaves are coming out next spring. Okay. So right now, um, what are we seeing in Vermont? Well, we're seeing a lot of defoliation in parts of the state. Statewide, we're seeing an increase in this insect. We started to see that last year. Um, but this year we see uh, pockets of very heavy defoliation and a concentration, I would say, in, in northern, northeastern Vermont. And where is that focused? Yeah, <clears throat> there's a, quite a big outbreak sort of on the Route 14 corridor, mm -hmm. uh, kind of north of Hardwick, going up through Craftsbury, Irisburg, Albany, mm -hmm. Lowell Mountain. There's another hot spot, you might call it, on uh, western Lamoille County, Waterville, Johnson area. So how long is this outbreak going to last? Well, the natural enemies, it is a native insect, so its natural enemies will bring it under control. Um, so in any one place, uh, we can expect one, two, three years is the max usually of defoliation in any one place, and then it'll disappear for another 10 or so year, and, and it'll be hard to find forest tent caterpillar. So what are their natural enemies? Um, well, at low populations, what you'd expect, it's the birds, it's the, um, uh, the spiders, et cetera. But at the higher populations, usually it's a virus disease that brings the outbreaks to a close. And so what should landowners be looking for? Well, right at the moment, and I think we have some pictures of these things, right mm -hmm. at the moment we have, um, people should be looking at for the caterpillars in the trees, and they, like I say, they may still be feeding. Mm -hmm. um, and there you see Ugh. a picture of caterpillars. They don't actually make tents, but they do congregate together to rest during the heat of the day. And you may see that on the side of the trees. Like I say, it's, they're just about done with feeding, so it may be a little late to see that. Um, the next slide, I think, we'll be seeing uh, the defoliation. People should be, should be out there looking right now. They don't like the veins very much, so <laughs> that's why you see the skeletons of the leaves there. Um, in the next slide, we're going to see the fragments of leaves on the forest floor. They don't, they're not very thorough eaters. They're pretty messy, and so if you're walking through the woods and you see lots of little green leaf pieces on the floor, look up and see what's at the top of the trees and see where they came from. In the next slide, we're going to see the the pupae, the cocoons that we saw earlier wrapped up in the leaves. Now you can't see the cocoons in this slide, but you can see those rolled up leaves, those dark 
places where the leaves are rolled up, and that's when you look up at the, in the canopy of the trees, you can actually see those, and they stand out from the other foliage. And that's what you'll be seeing right now. You may see these cast skins when the, when the caterpillars were young. When caterpillars grow, they cast their skins every now and then, about four, five, six times, and they leave their cast, cast skins behind, and that, that's what you'll see, something like that. Um, so that's a sign that they've been here. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different things to look for right now. Okay, but these are not the same as the caterpillars that make the big, big, huge webbing that you see. That's correct. correct. Yep. Yeah, that, that's the eastern tent caterpillar, which mm -hmm. is uh, favors more fruit trees, uh, your cherries, your apples, and that sort of thing. They make a very conspicuous net uh, tent um, that's easily seen from far away. And they do look similar. Mm -hmm. um, they are have a very um, noticeable caterpillar stage that people can see, but we're talking about forest tent, um, which is a, a different pest. Right, and so what should landowners do? Or should they be doing? So the first thing I think Barbara mentioned is that this is a native pest. This is something that, that our trees in Vermont have evolved with. Um, it, and they have a, um, a way of adapting. They store lots of carbohydrates. The same sugars that we harvest in the spring in the sugaring season are some of the same um, fuel and energy they'll use to reflush leaves. Uh, sugar maples that have been completely defoliated should be putting on some new leaves mid to late July. Um, they won't look the same. We had some really nice green foliage early this spring and, and early summer. These are going to be more stunted. They're not going to look quite as pretty, but they'll still function um, to help the tree store more carbohydrates for the long winter and uh, for next spring's growth. Um, I think it's important for landowners sugar maker, uh, and sugar makers to go into their woods and see the extent of the, the impact. That'll help them make management decisions about next year. It's really too late to do anything uh, to control those caterpillars this year, but you really want to be able to plan ahead, mm -hmm. know how big the defoliation will be, and... Um, can you control the outbreak? I mean, can you, is there something you could spray? There's a, there is a uh, organic pesticide um, uh, known as BT, um, which will um, help control the population. It needs to be, to be effective, it should be sprayed aerially, so yeah. that's a professional who would mm -hmm. be involved in that. Um, and it has to be ingested by the caterpillar, so the timing is really critical. Um, you can't really do it whenever you want. It has to be catch those caterpillars when they're feeding, so that there'll have to be a little bit of defoliation next year in order to time it just right. And then all the things you might imagine, you know, late May uh, weather and, um, can be tricky, so you want to make sure that everything lines up properly. It also helps to have, um, you need to have a certain size area to really be effective. Mm -hmm. So what, what do sugar makers want to know about what's going on? Well, I mean, cl clearly in sugaring you're dealing with um, crop trees. I mean, some sugar make, make, makers spend so much time in their woods um, tending to their forest, really promoting the growth of, of sugar maple. That in, in a way can also predispose them to a greater impact because you have, in some cases, a monoculture, which is basically setting the table for this pest and making it easier for them to defoliate wide areas. Long term, sugar makers should think about having uh, some diversity in their woods. Like Barbara said, red maple is really not a preferred host. We have a, a slide in there showing almost complete defoliation of the sugar maple with a red maple right next to it where they, they basically turn their nose up and say, not interested in that. Yeah. So if producers can have a mix of species that can help break the, break the, um, the outbreak a little bit. Um, and just realize that this is a native pest. Um, the trees, sugar maple, um, relied on our as humans to, to for their survival. They'd they'd be in kind of big <laughs> trouble. So um, it's important for them to to take a breath. Um, so a mature bit. trees that that are in the bush have withstood this kind of infestation before too. Right. Um, if specific management things, if if your if your sugar bush is on a marginal site where it's more prone to drought or it, the nutrition of the soils aren't really really ideal for sugar maple, um, you might think about um, con being more conservative in your tapping. Certainly smaller trees will have a smaller storage capacity for sugars. Mm -hmm. They might think about um, reducing the number of very small trees that they tap 
And if they have multiple taps per tree, that would be another thing they could, they could choose to just limit to one tap per tree. Mm -hmm. And now what about, um, the trees can, can overcome this, what about if we have like a, a drought later in the summertime, another stressor on the tree? Is that a concern? Mm -hmm. Certainly trees store their stresses, so if we have a one, two, three punch with trees, sometimes that will be the thing that will put them over the edge. And it's why uh, for forest landowners in general, uh, we suggest if they see that an outbreak is coming or has just occurred that they avoid any kind of additional disturbance. If people are doing a timber, timber harvest, any kind of serious cutting in their woodlands, to postpone it a few years so the trees have a chance to recover from the defoliation before the, an additional stress is added. Do these caterpillars eat anything else? They move on to gardens or other plants? They can. They can, they can um, certainly uh, chew on some of the understory plants if they're very hungry, um, but it certainly doesn't sustain them very long. What they're really uh, designed for and evolved with are these uh, forest trees. Are these forest tent caterpillars impacted by weather? Does that, is that part of the cycle? Yeah, well, we, we always hope, we think, well, Vermont's cold, uh, cold weather will kill them, and it's very hard to kill forest tent caterpillars with cold weather. Um, sometimes in the springtime, we'll have a late spring frost that'll kill them. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that'll also kill the maple buds as they're developing, but the maple buds come back faster than the tent caterpillars. So weather conditions are important. Uh, wet weather will determine whether or not the diseases spread rapidly or not. Um, so there's always an effect of weather on both the caterpillars and the trees. Mm -hmm. And so um, our focus is on the forest tent caterpillar, but we're also seeing an increase, I guess, in the eastern tent caterpillar. What's the difference between the two of them other than the webbing. Yeah, so, so Mark had mentioned that um, the, the insect that you may think of when you think of tents is this one. It's a different insect, um, likes cherries and apples, the eastern tent caterpillar. In the crotches of the trees, you'll see these tents. In the, in the late summer, you'll see the webs on the, on the end of the branches. That's a different insect, a third insect we're not mm -hmm. going to talk about today. But the eastern tent looks like this. Um, it has a stripe down its back it's a, and a black head. If you compare it to the forest tent caterpillar, which I think is in the next slide, you can see that the eastern oh, tent okay. caterpillar on the top has a long white stripe, and uh, you can't see it here, but a black <coughs> head. The forest tent caterpillar has these uh, white footprints, we call them, down <laughs> the back, and maybe uh, some blue stripes, and if you saw the head, it would be blue in color. And so once again, um, we're seeing them this year. Were they here last year? The yeah, they're always here. It's a native pest um, in very low, low numbers, and it isn't really until you have a massive outbreak that um, they're very quite conspicuous. Is there something that causes the outbreak other than just sort of the perfect conditions for them to, to breed and reproduce? They, uh, there's been a lot of research done, that, what on, done on that. Why are there outbreaks of forest tent caterpillar? And uh, there's some indication that when it's a little dry, that the, the foliage, nutrients in the foliage change and they become more tasty for, and more tasty for the tent caterpillars. But I think there's a lot of unknowns mm -hmm. about why they build up. Yeah. And so we know that next year they'll be here too, a lot of them in greater numbers, right? Yeah, so one of the things that can be done, um, it, it really has to happen later after the leaves fall, is you can do a survey looking at how many of those egg masses each tree has. Mm -hmm. And that can be a pretty good predictor of the intensity of the defoliation for the coming year. And that's when landowners are going to make their decisions whether or not it makes sense to spray um, or if it is predicted to be a, a pretty low, a low turnout. But as Barbara said, typically two to three years of heavy defoliation and then the population crashes again. Mm -hmm. And that's been very well documented over the years. So what should landowners be doing? Going out into their woods and surveying, but then what? If they're concerned, if there's a sugar maker particularly where they have to harvest a crop every year, if, if they're concerned about forest tent caterpillars, uh, call their county forester, call the UVM extension people, and uh, ex talk about their concerns. Uh, we are available um, to assist with doing the egg, ma egg mass surveys once the leaves are off the trees for sugar makers that are concerned about and are considering about possibly spraying next year. Mm -hmm. So um, it's something that we're able to do, uh, but, and people should get themselves on a list so that we can come and talk with them and, and see if that's a concern in their location. I think they should also realize that um, just because a tree is defoliated doesn't mean it's going to die. Um, there will be some increased mortality, but nothing like the extent that you see in these really um, widespread defoliations. Um, they should know that the growth rate is going to be 
greatly reduced in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Not only the years during defoliation, but a few years after. So they should think about that when they're, you know, um, when you're thinking about the sustainability of, of, of things, and mm -hmm. sugaring is certainly a part of it, you need to be able to have enough growth to make up for what's removed when you're, when you're tapping. All right, well, thank you both for joining us and talking about this. Thank That's you. our program for today. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.